Great, thank you. I'm going to continue with our marine theme. First, again, I want to orientate us to the importance of reefs as we're sitting here in a landlocked state. Um, quickly, there's a variety of things that reefs provide to society, but really, I just want to point out that the bio socioeconomic uh, services and resources provided by reefs is evaluated at around $12 trillion. Um, so a highly productive system on a variety of levels. Now, just to highlight some trends within the coral reef community, Andia has done a great job of orientating you to the system, but really, uh, I just want to point out some things and the organisms that I'll be looking at within this uh, within this talk. But really, we have a kind of a conspicuous soft coral here, a sea fan, Gorgonia ventilina, Nephades erecta sponge here, a hard coral Andia had mentioned. Um, in this case, it's a Montastri cavernosa, and then a macroalgae here that also is a calcifier. Uh, calcifying chlorophyte, but really what we've seen uh, across a 40 year time span, you can see on the bottom figure here is uh, an estimate of the global averages from 10 eco regions around the world done by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. And really what we see globally is that hard coral cover is declining, whereas uh, and with a concomitant increase in macroalgae. And a lot of this has to do with the stressors affecting coral reefs. These, of course, are plentiful and often synergize. In uh, interesting ways, some can be antagonistic and so on. But what I'm going to focus on in this talk is purely temperature stress uh, and really anomalous stressors in which sea surface temperatures deviate from a climatology or a long term average. So, what you're seeing here is a product from NOAA, NOAA Coral, NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, and it's a five kilometer resolution. And what you're seeing is degree heating weeks. And this is the scale on the bottom here. And degree heating weeks is a measure combining both the intensity and duration of thermal stress. So the longer, the deeper colors you see here, especially in the Caribbean basin, uh, is really unprecedented in the last 40 years. We haven't seen this type of uh, extreme stressor since uh, the conception of Coral Reef Watch. So of course, this isn't isolated. This isn't an isolated event. This happens in the Great Barrier Reef as well. This is what you're seeing in panel A here is an aerial view of these patch reefs. And really, when we zoom into them, we can see this ghostly pale nature that uh, typically comes with coral bleaching. And this is a physiological response. You know, this has been well studied. I'm trying to get us all through this. But uh, corals, of course, can become really vulnerable in this state and uh, are really uh, susceptible to things like disease and overgrowth and competition at this stage. And um, in terms of competition, of course, there's a variety of alternative benthic organisms within these uh, ecosystems. So you have uh, conspicuous macroalgae, soft coral sponges, and hard coral. And these, of course, are, I'm hoping you can gain some appreciation of their diversity through these images. These, um, these different functional groups serve a variety of uh, purposes within uh, the community. So, come to this knowledge gap, really, I think Andia has done a wonderful job of uh, presenting her previous model, but that model had um, didn't include the alternative benthic organisms that I previously just showed you. It was solely focused at the colony uh, uh, colony level uh, with interactions mainly just between coral and sponges and then sort of a, a stratum state, including algae. Um, so you can see um, that progress here as well as her straight transition model, but really we wanted to involve more interactions between these alternative benthic organisms at a more complex state involving not just maybe two or a pairwise interaction, but a multi-species interaction of three or more of these functional groups uh, in contact. So again, from a successional point of view, most of our understanding of how thermal stress influence or how thermal stress affects species interactions and how that ultimately constructs uh, different communities. So my objective was to use changes in the benthos of Broward County, Florida coral reefs to predict its future composition uh, using intensifying thermal scenarios concordant with global climate models. And this is just an abstract representation of what uh, community shifts can um, can look like in response to a persistent change in an environmental parameter. In this case, thermal anomalies intensifying and becoming more persistent. So you can have these threshold events where the community is completely wiped out. You have a stark change within the dominant organism, or you can be, it can be more linear. Um, so my hypothesis was that given a lot of these, uh, or given the susceptibility of these hardcore organisms, it's likely that their propensity to interact with those other alternative benthic organisms will become less with these future scenarios because um, 
they're likely becoming more vulnerable. You have some hardcore persisting within the community. Oftentimes, though, they're smaller um, and they're weedier, more stress resistant. So it's likely that we're going to see shifts to more sponges, soft coral, and macroalgae interactions with these scenarios. So here's my study area, uh, the Southeast Florida Reef Tract. And at, you can see my three study sites. So again, we're getting pretty fine in scale. But uh, and at each of these sites are belt quadrat transects of 30 square meter dimension or 30 meter square dimension. And uh, with any transect is 40 photo quadrats of 0 0.75 square dimension. And you can see this camera kind of right here orientated downwards, looking at the benthos, taking images annually. Now, my study sites are uh, particularly ideal to understand how thermal stress affects interactions within a changing community because Broward County, where my sites are located, is the most thermally stressed within the sub these uh, six subregions. So um, my study uh, period is really from 2003 to 2018. And conveniently, the 2005 Caribbean hot stressor, the 2010 local cold stressor, and the multi-year global coral reef bleaching event from 2014 to 2017 encompasses or lies within my study frame. So I use these uh, timestamps really to understand uh, how or to model how uh, to model the changes in the community. Really is just a simple uh, example of the photo quadrat as well as uh, the different benthic habitat types running parallel to the shoreline of Florida. Um, here's my Pretty simple experimental design. Really, you have a depth gradient from shore uh, to offshore, uh, but these are shallow coral reefs, and there's triplicates at each site. Um, and analyzed, you know, assessed over 15 years, this amounted to 124 photo quadrats used to parameterize the model. I think I mentioned this early, but really, how we are conceptualizing interactions within this environment is based on direct contact. Uh, given I'm using images to analyze changes, I can't necessarily uh, understand other effects like allele chemicals exchanged into the water column, but I'm solely looking at um, the contact between these organisms in different uh, intimacies and uh, combinations. So you can have you know, your solitary examples as well as pairwise and multi-species situations. So re to really quantify this change, I applied a patch design in which we have these uh, randomly distributed patches within a photo quadrat, and I assess changes within them. So you can see these swatch colors here. Uh, these essentially represent different combinations of those states I showed. And from 2003, this is the same photo quadrat on the reef. Uh, across an annual time step, you can see this complex interaction here changing solely to a sponge. So we have a complete loss of these certain um, states within this area and this is i know this is a lot but um this is really just a hypothetical example uh, just to drive you through how i actually develop these probabilities of transition so starting in patch one in 2003 we see that interacting soft coral sponge transition solely to a soft coral so this is really just logged here in the patch transition pathway for patch one as just a change from that interaction to a solitary soft coral and because that was the only state proportioning that patch, essentially it's a probability of one because I observed it across that time span. So the same process is done for patches with more states in them. Essentially they're just fractioned, uh, their proportions are fractioned to ultimately uh, get to the state transition probability matrix. But model parameterization again, were these nine photo quadrats with a square 15 by 15 probability matrix. So uh, this was built by year pairs, so changes from 2003 to 2004, et cetera. And then some of the model definitions used were uh, 56 square kilometers is the colonizable hot bottom within Broward County. And this was done uh, by work with Brian Walker, not my work, but he provided that value. And then we used the conditions from 2018 to map into the 22nd century or project, excuse me, and see um, what the future community may look like and what types of interactions are prevalent within it. Uh, this was done over 100 iterations with a kind of goofy cell size and matrix. But again, to try to validate the model, uh, really this is an iterative and imperfect, but I needed to demonstrate that there's some agreement between what I'm the simulation outcomes and the reality of interest, which is ultimately um, what validation truly is. Uh, to parameterize a bleaching effect or the effects of thermal anomalies in these communities as scenarios, I used a sub matrix shown here. And this is, 
you know, the, all the probabilities of transition between different states. And essentially, I have these bleaching scenarios, three of them. And this was, um, these were Van Hoydonk and Hughes were really kind of my motivation for these. I used um, some global climate models and then uh, some values for expected onsets of bleaching in the future. To move to the interaction dynamics model, really this is just the pathway diagram in panel A. And we can see the states uh, around the circumference and between them, all the arrows are the transition types. And they're grouped by color essentially to ecologically relevant phenomena like competition or indeterminate succession in reefs. And then the size of the circle indicates how many total transitions that it was seen to exhibit. and the the thickness of the arrow indicates the actual probability shown within this unified mean transition matrix. So, uh, and lastly, B is just essentially a breakdown of the, of the transition types by transition group. So you can see within our model, there's a lot of uncertainty in many ways, given such a, a long time step of a year. Now there's a lot of complexity within that uh, scramble. So I wanted to filter it by transition group just to give you a sense of where things are going and what's contributing most. But uh, I think it's a nice, again, you can see on the bottom here with the legend, you can see um, persistence, competition, uh, mortality, et cetera. And some of the base, uh, or this is really the base model and empirical dynamics. And I have to contradict Andia a little bit. This is, uh, you know, these are, I mean, I click the spatial button to, to make a roster, but in no way is that uh, spatially explicit. Um, but essentially C and D, the panel C and D represent uh, the starting and ending points of the community of this time series. So we can see that this reef is mainly dominated by sponges, macroalgae and soft coral. Uh, but the interactions here are also highly interesting, especially soft coral and sponges, which um, were at a relative to be high or percentage of the reef. Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of model validation, uh, you can see here this this top panel is within the red area here. That's what I showed on the last screen. That's essentially the the base model, and then overlaid upon that is the raw microhabitat patch proportion. So, um, it's you know there's some agreement there, but there's also you know a lot more variability within the observed data. On the bottom is really a simple linear regression of our observed and simulated proportions showing, showing some general agreement, but there is some um, there's some pull. There's less variability within the simulated relative to the observed. The benthic community predictions. I know this is a lot and uh, it's not too pretty, but really what we saw is that with a six year interval, this isn't enough to push the community over the hill. Um, it doesn't really change much in terms of interactions um, or declines in certain states, as you see here. But if you're if we're to see annual severe bleaching um, by mid-century, so bleaching at a severe intensity every year by the, either 2054 or 2043 relative to those RCPs, we're actually seeing a movement of the community to less solitary organisms and more interactions particularly between highly competitive sponges and soft corals. And um, there's also kind of a trace of hard coral within that as they do persist uh, within the community as we do your species, but they're experiencing a lot of uh, pressure from the soft coral and sponge shades as well as macroalgae. So um, what will a future community look like, especially in the Caribbean region? The nude of hard coral. So, of course, from this image, we can, you know, still appreciate the beauty of, uh, of coral reefs. You know, they're incredibly flowing in form and function and color. But it seems, like Ani had mentioned, it's likely that the reef will enter a more erosional state and get patchier and flatter. Um, but of course, Florida is built upon a limestone structure. So, as uh, sea level rises, these new novel organisms within this community may colonize more areas of that limestone and be able to provide a similar fish assemblage, not only uh, fin, but shellfish, which is huge in Florida. So there's a cascading effect, of course, of changes in communities and what that provides ultimately back to society. So within this Anthropocene umbrella we are experiencing, we have losing and winning interactions. And in terms of food source and the thermal resistance of communities, all the way down to you know the provision of habitat and socioeconomic services, a lot of this can change. Reefs may move to a more 
are selective nature, they're rapid, you have organisms rapidly colonizing, and you have less of a climactic uh, community where things are more stable. So the stability of reefs are definitely in question, excuse me, in the future. So I think some directions of this research uh, need to, you know, there's there's many issues with this model. One, it's non-spatial, uh, so we would love to shift our attention um, to that, of course. You know, the oceans are an enormous area, cover far more than land, so this is really an untapped area to to really utilize STSIM and its features, but we also want to leverage remote sensing uh, as well as computer vision and artificial intelligence to really expedite quantifying species interactions. So being able to distinguish what a solitary organism relative to one that's interacted or in an interacted state, um, as well as you know incorporating different things uh, like maybe um, other packages within SDSIM really to I make this model more holistic and see it, uh, I guess, at different resolutions, not only at a functional group, but also at species. So can we can we move to species level within these reefs, which I know sounds intense. Yeah. Um, so to conclude, I know this is a really simple slide, but really we're moving from this within a Caribbean sea. It seems like we're moving from this archetypal coral reef that we all know to a novel reef community with more interactions between different organisms that have received far less attention uh, by us. So, you know, the implications for this have yet to really be explored, um, you know, historic reef versus future reef, but it's something we're really fascinated with and has a lot of uh, important, uh, means a lot, I think, to society. So it's something we should, uh, that warrants further study. So I think I'm getting close to getting booted, but I need to acknowledge a range of people, NSF for uh, funding, uh, for, uh, you know, allowing me to be here. I think I need to thank Harbor Branch uh, at Florida Atlantic University. I'd like to thank the Integrative Marine and Coastal Ecology Lab for all their insights, the uh, Nova Southeastern University, specifically the Coral Reef Restoration Assessment and Monitoring Lab led by Dr. David Gilliam, a co-author in this presentation, and then valuable, valuable contributions from Dr. Shirley Pomponi and Timothy Moore, uh, who are in my advisor or supervisory committee. My advisor, Andia, thank you so much for allowing me to be here and uh, interface with everyone here. This has been utterly crazy. And the organizing committee, thank you all for this wonderful opportunity and being able to talk with you and bounce ideas. It's been brilliant. And the sponsors, USGS, Apex, RMS, and TNC. With that, please bring it on.